Hello, a very warm welcome to everyone that has joined us for this webinar on an introduction to pollinating insects and managing land for pollinators. My name is Alice Parfit and I'm a conservation officer with Buglife and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our insect pollinators today, who they are, why they are important and a few tips on what we can all do to help them out when managing land and that's whether that's in a, a garden or a park or a local green space or, or just a window box. So this talk is being brought to you uh, as part of the Peterborough Bee Lines project which is led by Peterborough Environment City Trust and is funded through the National Lottery Heritage Fund, People's Postcode Lottery, Peterborough City Council and Viridor. So we have over 40,000 species of invertebrates in the UK and they provide us with a range of free services. Um, these are all important ecosystem services such as pollination, which I'm obviously going to talk about today. Um, but they also provide us um, with services like seed dispersal, nutrient cycling, aeration of the soil, control of pest species, to name just a few. So what is pollination? Well, essentially, it is the movement of pollen from one plant to another, which enables fertilisation and seed production. Uh, pollination can be carried out by wind or, or water, but the majority does actually involve an animal vector, with insects being the largest group. Um, and recent estimates are that 80% of British wild plants are pollinated by insects. So why is this important? Well, it's absolutely essential for the production of food for human consumption. Many of our crops are dependent on pollination by insects, and this includes things like um, fruits, onions, cabbages, uh, sunflowers um, and chocolate as well. Um, and this is thought to be worth around £690 million per year in the UK. So having uh, insects provide this uh, insect pollination service has also been shown to increase the uh, yield and quality of crops. And 85% of all wildflower and flowering crop species do depend on animals, mostly insects for pollination. And pollination is also important for wider ecosystem function. And by that, I mean that um, a huge number of our wildflowers are dependent on insects for their pollination. And so insect pollination has been shown to be essential to maintaining a healthy and thriving environment. OK, so um, let's take a little look at who our pollinators are. Um, well, these are insects that visit flowers and are known to or are likely to carry pollen between a number of flowers. Uh, the entomologist Stephen Falk has estimated that there are around 6,000 insect species that regularly visit flowers and that we can therefore consider to be pollinators. And as you might expect, there's a, a, a range of insects involved. Um, our bees are big pollinators. Um, we have around 270 species of, of bee in the UK, and these are all known to be pollinating insects. Um, wasps um, are also really good um, pollinators. We've got about 9,000 species of wasp in the UK. 2,000 of these, or around 2,000 of these, are known to visit flowers. Um, flies are a very important group of, of pollinators. Uh, around 1500 species are thought to be pollinating um, insects. And uh, beetles also contribute to pollination services. So we've got a lot of beetle species, over 4000 species of beetle in the UK, and around 250 of them are known to visit flowers. Um, butterflies and moths are also flower visitors. Um, we have over 1500 species known to, to visit flowers. Um, and then we also have sort of uh, species such as um, sawflies um, that also visit flowers and therefore are considered pollinators. Our most significant pollinators in the UK belong to three insect orders. The most important of these 
ones are um, is the Hymenoptera, which includes our bumblebees, solitary bees and the honeybee. And these are considered to be commercially significant um, groups because um, bees purposefully visit flowers to collect pollen to take back to their nest to feed their developing young. And for that reason, they're the most effective pollinators. We also have the um, Diptera, so that, that's our flies, um, and particularly our, our hoverflies, but not just limited to, to hoverflies, are really important pollinators. Um, lots of different fly um, species that are, are visiting flowers. Um, and then finally, we have our, our Lepidoptera, so that's the butterflies and moths. And these aren't considered to be commercially significant, but are very important pollinators of wild flowers. So as I just mentioned, uh, all bees are considered pollinators. So they're visiting flowers to get nectar for, for energy. And the females are also collecting uh, the protein rich pollen to take back to feed their developing young. And there's an incredible diversity within the UK, UK bees. They have different nesting preferences, different food preferences, um, mating habits, habitat requirements. And they can look really different in appearance as well, which we'll see over the next couple, couple of slides. So we have over 270 species in the UK. There's 24 species of bumblebee and around 250 species of solitary bee. And that number is always changing as we discover new species um, arriving from, from the continent. Here we have some of our bumblebees. Um, this group is easy to recognise. They tend to have large, densely furry bodies. Some have colour blands or different colour tips to the tail. Some are completely ginger, like uh, the common carder bee shown here. Um, and you can see how they might be good at transferring pollen from one flower to, no to another. And we're generally familiar with them in our gardens and green spaces. Bumblebees are social, so they form nesting colonies from a few dozen workers up to several hundred. And they utilise old small mammal burrows for their nests or grassy tussocks, bird boxes and, and sometimes uh, wood piles as well. So they have an annual life cycle involving this mass provisioning of pollen to feed their young. They also collect nectar to take back um, to the nest, but this is only in a very limited way. Um, and you can see that they're fairly recognisable. So, um, for example, our, our red tail bumblebee shown here on the top right, all black with this lovely red tail. So that's a, a very easy one to recognise. Then along the bottom, we've got some of our um, bumblebees that are sort of black with yellow stripes, either two or, or three yellow stripes. Um, and then slightly different uh, coloured tips to their tail. And here we have our solitary bees. This is by far the biggest group of bees and are so named as each female has her own nest and lays her own eggs, rather than having a queen that produces all of the young. And this group is vast, over 250 species in the UK. And many people are not really aware of this group at all, let alone that there are so many different species. So they do go under the radar a little bit, but they're really fascinating bees. And as you can see from this slide, they're rather variable in appearance. So there is no hard and fast rule to recognising one. Some are rather wasp-like, while some look a, a bit more like uh, small bumblebees. Some are hairier than others. So you can see that they vary in appearance, but they also vary in their behaviour too. They have different nesting habitats. Some are very niche and associated with particular plants or habitats, while others are much more widespread and can be common, commonly found in gardens and more urban areas. So I'm just going to show a, uh, give a few examples of, of these. So we're in the middle, top middle there, we've got our tawny mining bee, and this has got this lovely foxy red pile. Um, which makes it very recognisable. Um, it forages on spring blossoming shrubs, so things like willows, blackthorn, hawthorns. It's ground nesting. Um, so if you notice little sort of volcanoes of, of soil in your, in your lawn, um, it's worth investigating to see whether it's this species. At the bottom right, we have um, our ivy mining bee. This is the last solitary bee to emerge each se season. Um, ivy is its main pollen and nectar source, 
um, though females do forage on um, other flowers as well. And uh, it nests in bare, sparsely vegetated soils, so especially south facing slopes. Um, a hairy footed flower bee on the top right. This is one you're likely to see in, in gardens and green spaces. It looks very much like a small bumblebee. Forages on things like dwarf comfrey, uh, red dead nettle, rosemary, primrose. And this is a, a cavity nesting species. So uh, maybe seen entering nests in sort of stone or, or brick walls sort of in the mortar. Um, so uh, at the bottom middle, we've got Gooden's nomad bee. This is a, a kleptoparasitic species, meaning that they lay their eggs in the nest of other species, um, primarily other mining bee species. Um, and they look um, very wasp like and, and they're not not a hairy bee um, at all. And then we've also got our wool carder bee down here on, on the bottom left. And um, this is frequent in gardens in, in sort of southern England um, and is another species that um, is a cavity nester in, in pre existing holes. And I'll, I'll probably talk about that one a little bit later on. OK, so now we'll have a little look at our diptera. So that's our flies. Um, flies have one pair of wings um, rather than the two that our bees have. Um, they're great pollinators and, as I mentioned previously, are, are commercially significant. Over 1500 species are, are thought to be pollinators um, as they visit flowers to get nectar and, and can visit a, a lot of flowers. Flies are found across all habitats from gardens, meadows, woodlands, salt marsh. Um, and as you might expect with this diversity, they also have a wide range of feeding habits. Um, some are predatory species, some um, feed on decaying wood or plants, um, and some feed on nectar and pollen. So this slide just shows you the diversity of flies that are out there. Um, we have soldier flies, which have this lovely striking coloration, and um, hence the name. Um, adults are often seen on umbellifers. Um, whereas the larvae are aquatic or terrestrial feeders on, on algae or decaying vegetable matter. Uh, we've got a bee fly down at the bottom right, which you might be familiar with, have this long proboscis. So um, are often seen on, on things like primrose in the spring. These are actually parasitoids of solitary bees and, and wasps. Um, and then we've also got a you know, huge amount of um, house flies. Um, which are sort of grey to black species, sometimes metallic green or blue, and they include some of our most abundant um, flies in the UK, particularly those that are associated with dung. Hoverflies are a really important family of flies. Um, nice selection shown here. We've got around 280 species in the UK. They're often considered the gardener's favourite as some feed on aphids. So they're really important for predator control as well as pollination. Um, many mimic bees and wasps, uh, presumably as a, a defence mechanism. Some don't appear to uh, mimic anything. So in the top middle, we've got uh, a hoverfly called Volucella bombylans, which looks remarkably like the red tailed bumblebee we saw in one of the previous slides. Um, the adults of these will be seen on um, a sort of open flowers, so things like um, oxide daisy, hogweeds, brambles, um, but the larvae develop as scavengers and larval predators in the nests of bumblebees and social wasps. Uh, at the bottom left there, we've got um, this really lovely uh, hoverfly called Pellicera aurata, which has got this bright bronzy abdomen, long black antennae with white tips. Um, adults are found on things like uh, bramble or, or rose flowers in, in wooded settings, but the larvae develop in wet cavities of mature trees and tree stumps. And then in the uh, bottom middle, we've got one of our Chalosia species, and, and this is a large genus of, of hoverflies. Um, the larvae are mostly uh, phytophagous, which means they develop inside the roots or, or stems. Um, of plants or, or graze them from the outside beneath the soil service, surface. Um, this is actually Chylosia antica, whose larvae mine the roots of um, primroses. 
So our final group of pollinators that we're going to look at today are our butterflies and moths. So we have 59 species of butterfly in the UK and over two and a half thousand species of, of moth. So around 1500 species of these are considered to be pollinators. So they're regular um, flower visitors and they're visiting flowers obviously to get nectar for the adults. Um, the larvae have a, a wide range of um, requirements, but they tend to be associated with um, plant species. So, for example, a common blue butterfly um, lays its eggs on things like um, bird's foot trefoil, some of our clovers, and then the larvae feed on that particular plant. So for a lot of our um, butterflies and moths, um, plant species, particular plant species are very important for them. OK, so we've had a little look at um, some of our pollinating insects um, and now we're going to have a little look at um, what they actually need to complete the whole of their life cycle. So the first thing that we need to think about is having food for both the adult and the larval stages. And I've touched on on this on some of the previous slides anyway, but just to sort of have a little recap. Um, they do have a, a wide range of feeding habits. Um, pollen and nectar is required, um, but also um, leaves and plant stems, roots, fungi. Some species feed on um, other invertebrates, so the hoverflies that are aphid feeders, for example. Some have requirements for decaying wood. So quite a wide range of, of habitats. Um, needed for the insects to complete the, the whole of their life cycle. So adults need flowers as a source of protein rich pollen. So bees, for example, use that to uh, provision their young so they have uh, something to eat um, and they also require it for sugar rich nectar. Um, the particular pollinator species, its size and shape, um, all dictate which sort of flowers uh, they can use. Um, hoverflies, for example, um, lack any specialised mouth parts, so they prefer to visit flowers where the nectar is easy to reach. So open species like umbellifers, thistles um, and knapweeds, which we've got uh, along the uh, top row um, of this, this slide here, um, that's what they prefer. Um, butterflies have long proboscis, um, so are able to reach nectar in, in deeper flowers. And you might have seen that in your garden. If you if you have buddleia, for example, the, the uh, butterflies really go for that. Bees have a wide range of flowers they visit. Um, some species collect pollen and nectar from a really wide range of, of plants. Others, for example, the uh, large scabious mining bee collect from just a, a few closely related scabious plants. And then there are some species that are adapted to, to only use one species of plant. So to suit the widest range of pollinator species, a mix of open and deep flowered um, plants are required. Bumblebees are separated into a long tongued and short tongued species, and this affects what flowers that they can use. So long tongued species such as the garden bumblebee here on the left um, can reach into uh, deep flowers to get the nectar. So things like foxgloves, primroses, bluebells, comfrey, that sort of thing. Um, whereas the uh, early bumblebee on the right here has a short tongue, so needs to feed on much more open flowers. Um, but the great thing about um, some of these short tongue species is that they are also able to uh, rob the nectar from flowers and bypass any of the uh, sort of pollination that we would like them to, to take, undertake. Um, and they do this by biting a hole in, in the bottom of a, a deep flower, gets the nectar um, that way. And having a continuity of um, food through all the seasons is really important. Um, different species of pollinating insects are active at different times of the year, some for just a short period to coincide with their um, particular flowers that they use, 
Others are active for long periods. So yeah, the continuity of flowering is, is really important. So things like trees and shrubs are really important in the spring, particularly things like uh, blackthorn um, and willows shown, shown here on, on the top and bottom left. Um, and other beneficial early species are things like dandelions, dead nettles, ground ivy. And then as the summer progresses, the legumes, daisy families, and umbellifers can be really important, and, and as are brambles, thistles, and, and hogweed. And then into the autumn, plants such as ivy is just fantastic. Um, it often provides that sort of final feast uh, for many of our overwintering adult insects. So this is just a quick recap again of some of our, our top pollinator plants. So trees and shrubs in the spring, um, our legumes, so things like clovers and birdfoot trefoils, really important um, in the summer. Open flowers are, are very important, so things like oxide daisy, dandelions, mallows, very important, and also um, our umbellifers as well. So we also need to think about what larvae feed on. So many larvae of butterflies, moths, and some flies feed on plant stems, leaves, and, and also roots of plants. Um, some uh, are species specific. So for example, the caterpillar of the small blue butterfly just feeds on kidney vetch. Um, hoverflies and, and flies um, have a wide range of larval feeding habits, um, as well as feeding on, on plants. Some are predatory, so feeding on aphids or sort of wasp or ant larvae. So quite a wide range of, of habits if you're thinking about all of the pollinators. But often, um, if they feed on plants, structure is also an important requirement to um, take into consideration. So the next thing we need to think about when considering what pollinators uh, need are locations for nesting, so uh, laying their eggs. And again, because there is a wide variety of pollinating insects, there is a wide variety of habitats that are, are used, and this can range from um, long grass and, and scrub um, to plant stems, um, deadwood, bare soil, soft mortar in walls, um, yeah, will very much depend on the um, pollinating species. So some pollinators uh, will nest in sort of long grass and, and scrub and in sort of tussocky grassland, but also in hollow plant stems, and that's particularly things like uh, um, our bees, so bumblebees really like that sort of um, long tussocky grassland where there might be mammal holes for them to uh, breed in. And then a lot of our bees and wasps um, will uh, nest in hollow plant stems. So maintaining areas of uncut vegetation each year can be really important to provide that sort of suitable nesting habitat. Some of our solitary bees are uh, ground nesting, so they need bare earth or very short turf. And here we have examples of a, a natural and an artificial um, bee bank. So um, these sort of mining bees will use um, areas like this, but they're also useful for um, basking for a, a range of insects. And they tend to be sort of south facing slopes, so they're quite nice and warm and close to flower rich areas. Other bee species nest above ground um, in things like uh, deadwood or bramble stems or sometimes in, in the mortar of walls. Um, we've got a red mason bee here that you might be familiar with as this, uh, this one likes uh, to nest in a variety of pre-existing holes and cavities, um, especially in uh, timbers and hollow plant stems. Um, and this is the species that you're most likely to see if you have um, a, a, a bee hotel, so one shown here on, on the left. Um, hoverfly lagoons um, are also really good at providing habitat uh, for species whose larvae develop in, in rotting vegetation, so that's some of our hoverfly species in particular. And so retaining uh, dead and decaying branches and 
tree stumps and dead wood on site is is really important um obviously if there are issues around um health and safety then um that won't be possible but leaving as much dead wood on site um i think i mentioned earlier that there's some of our hoverflies that um nest in um tree hollows so really important to to leave those sorts of features on site as much as possible as well water is really important to many of our pollinators um at some point in their life cycle um many of our hoverflies use um uh, water or the sort of rotting vegetation at the edge of water to lay their eggs and so the the larvae are, are found there so really important for breeding habitats, but also um, water is, is important for thirsty insects and also wetland flowers are, are really good at providing um, forage for pollinators as well. We also need to think about um, having some shelter and overwintering habitats. So, for example, our queen bumblebees uh, overwinter as adults, so they need somewhere that they can survive the winter but also insects need somewhere that they can uh, get out of extreme weather, whether that's, um, you know, really hot, sunny conditions or adverse um, weather, um, rain and, and that sort of thing. So again, these sorts of habitats are similar to some of the um, nesting habitats, but things like tussocky gra grassland, compost heaps, um, log piles can all be really important. Um, and this is this is a good one to think about when uh, sort of tidying up in sort of gardens and green spaces, just leaving some of these areas um, for insects to overwinter is really important. It's also really important to have a, a variety of habitats um, present um, so that insects complete the can complete the whole of their life cycle. Um, Many of our hoverflies, for example, the adults need their nectar resources, but um, the larvae live in sort of water or sort of drainage ditches, ponds, edges of ponds, that sort of thing, and feed on the um, rotting vegetation at the edge of those. So ho those hoverflies need both of those habitats um, present. Another example is the wool carder bee that we saw earlier on in one of the um, um, slides on solitary bees. The adult is on the wing in June and July and feeds on flowers, gets the nectar from flowers uh, from the pea family. Um, she nests in holes in dead wood or plant stems, but the female also likes to line her nest with the fine hairs that she collects from hairy leaf plants, um, for example, lamb's ear. So she needs um, the correct nesting habitats and food resource and the hairy leaf plants um, to be present for her to complete the whole of the life cycle. And finally, it's just worth um, thinking about that the distance that pollinators can travel um, is, is not very far. So especially for some of our, our small bees, the um, food and nesting opportunities uh, need to be in close proximity to one another. Right, we've had a look at who our pollinators are and what they need to go through their complete life cycle. But why are we worried about them? Well, unfortunately, there have been some large declines in some of our pollinating species in the UK. For example, over a third of our bumblebee species have declined by 70 percent. Fifty six moth species have gone extinct since 1914 and 76 percent of butterfly species have declined over the past 40 years. So why is this happening? Well, it's due to a number of factors, but the most significant cause is the loss and degradation of habitat, which, as we have just seen, um, provides the food, shelter and breeding opportunities for our pollinating insects. We know that 97% of our wildflower meadows have disappeared since the 1930s. And unfortunately, much of what is left is small in size, it's fragmented, and isolated, meaning pollinating insects are unable to move through the landscape easily. Um, there are also issues around the multiple um, pesticide and herbicide use in agriculture and horticulture. 
these often have far reaching consequences uh, for invertebrates beyond just the simple target species. Neonicotinoid pesticides have been shown to have harmful effects on wildlife, not just to bees, but also to aquatic invertebrates and even birds. Commercially reared honeybees and bumblebees can carry pests and, dis and diseases that can affect wild populations if they were released or escaped into the wild. And also climate change is, is an issue. Pollinators may uh, get decoupled from their associated plants, um, so they emerge before or after their flowering time. Um, and as the climate warms, pollinators will need to move north, north to find uh, more ideal climatic conditions. And obviously this is not always possible if habitats are um, disconnected, so it makes these populations more vulnerable. Um, but climate change also leads to extreme weather at odd times of year, which can obviously be detrimental to insects in many ways. But there are actions we can all take to help reverse these declines by thinking about how we manage the land around us. So I'm going to go through some of the enhancements that we could all get involved with to benefit pollinating insects, whether this is in um, our garden, the local parks, school grounds or, or a bit of woodland. Um, and I'll go through some of these in, in turn. So first up, we'll take a look at some of the things that could be uh, done in public parks, school grounds, business parks, uh, where there might be extensive areas of formal landscaping or mown grassland, but might also contain mature trees, flower beds and shrubberies. OK, so first up, we'll have a little think about some of the um, formal bedding within um, sort of parks and, and areas like that. Um, and how they can be improved through the selection of pollinator friendly plants. So uh, things that can be planted are things like uh, cosmos, dahlias, angelic and rebecca is all really useful plants in, in these areas. They can provide um, a range of really strong colours and different growth forms to meet design requirements, while also being attractive to um, a range of pollinators. Um, and the important thing to think about here is also um, to have a diversity of flowering plants um, throughout the year. So they have that nectar source throughout the year. It's really worth investigating whether any formal grassland can be cut just that little bit higher. Um, it may be that there is species rich grassland present. You, you never know what might um, pop up. Um, but even if it's just um, allowing some clover, daisies and dandelions to flower, this will be um, really beneficial to our pollinating insects. In areas that are not required for recreation, so in, in, in public parks, um, for example, or are less formal areas, it'd be a great idea to try and leave some long grass over winter for all of those overwintering habitats that we mentioned earlier. Um, I really like this photo um, as it shows that leaving the long grass is a very deliberate management option, but people can still walk through, use the park, access the area, which is, is obviously very important. Um, you don't want to leave the long grass for years and years um, uncut, as this will mean it just becomes um, rank and lose any floral diversity. So cutting of long grass areas should be carried out on rotation. It may be that if you leave some areas of grass to grow, um, there's really no floral diversity sort of coming through. So it might be that there is benefit in um, having some wildflowers being, being sown um, as shown in, in this slide. Um, and actually this, this photo does show really nicely that mosaic of habitats of short grass, um, long grass with wildflowers um, and also um, a hedge line. So you've got some scrub. So there's um, lots of resources there for our pollinating insects, both um, pollen and nectar resources, but also sheltering and overwintering um, habitats and uh, nesting habitats too. It's also worth looking to see if there is space to allow some of the um, 
fringes to uh, grow a little bit wilder. So here we've got some hogweed in flower providing uh, really good natural nectar um, resources. Um, and if this can be done um, in some areas, then that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, it's probably also worth noting that not all paths or desire lines in, in a park should be hard surfaced or, or re-turfed. So those areas of short or bare, bare turf can be really important nesting areas, particularly for our um, solitary bees, as we, we saw earlier on. Um, and other things that could be considered within the sort of um, park or school grounds environment are, are creating wetland features. So um, adding a pond or marshy area would provide um, a home for pollinators with aquatic larvae. Or you could um, do something like a, a bee bank or erect a bee hotel. But do remember that these do need to be situated in the right place. So in a nice, warm, south facing um, position. OK, and I've just popped this one in here just to show that um, the smallest of spaces can be transformed um, to benefit our pollinating insects. So we've got some nice nectar resources in, in this small space in a car park with some lavender. I can see um, a tall yellow umbellifer and then a sort of smaller yellow um, daisy like um, flower. So really um, thinking about the plants, even in very formal um, positions, can really make a difference to our pollinating insects. OK, so now we'll take a look at the sorts of things we can do in our gardens to help pollinating insects. So gardens are an amazing resource as there are an estimated 16 million gardens in the UK covering over half a million hectares and therefore small changes to the way we garden can have enormous consequences and it doesn't matter whether you have a window box or a large garden they all add up to form an important network of varied habitat that is vital for pollinators and other wildlife as a sanctuary from flowerless uh, urban habitats or intensively farmed countryside so what are the sorts of things um, that we can do? Well, generally, the flowers uh, we plant uh, can make a big difference for our pollinating insects, um, as I mentioned previously. Simpler flowers will be better than sort of complex ones. So the double flowered plants that are bred for their looks generally don't have any pollen or, or nectar. Um, so think sort of cottage garden type plants. They're really great. Um, try and plant uh, native plants. Um, while non-native plants can still provide nectar and pollen, um, the larval stages of many of our pollinating insects do need the um, native plants um, for that part of their life cycle. We've mentioned this uh, previously, but um, cutting uh, your lawn a little less often um, will be really beneficial to pollinating insects. It allows um, plants such as daisies, buttercups or clover the chance to, to flower. So providing that valuable nectar and pollen. And um, of course, you don't need to do this over the whole of your lawn. You could just have um, an area that um, you try and, and see what happens um, and you never know what might come up. You could also create a compost heap and have a small wild area somewhere. So compost heaps are great for providing those uh, nesting, uh, nesting and sheltering opportunities for our pollinating insects, as well as a, a wide range of other wildlife. Um, and again, wild sort of corners of the garden can be great for sheltering nesting and overwintering sites for insects. So um, yeah, a real plea here to try not to be too tidy and pull up all of your weeds. Um, these can be really important pollen and nectar resources. Creating some additional habitats such as a pond will be really beneficial um, for insects um, as well as a whole range of other wildlife. And having that diversity of habitats will really encourage a greater diversity of pollinating insects. And if you have a small garden, um, then you don't need to have a large pond. You can create something just sort of washing up bowl size, and that will uh, provide lots of resources for our pollinating insects. 
Other things you could do is you could uh, put up a bee hotel, which would provide a home for some of our aerial nesting um, solitary bees, um, such as mason bees and, and leaf cutter bees. Um, you can buy uh, bee hotels or you can make your own just by drilling some holes in, in a piece of wood. But just make sure you site them somewhere sunny, um, about waist high, and hopefully you'll have hours of enjoyment of, of watching bees coming and going. And finally, you could also create a hoverfly lagoon. Um, and this is for a species such as hoverflies that use um, sort of rot holes or puddles um, as, a, as a breeding site. And this is literally just a container filled with organic matter. So um, leaves or grass cuttings or um, um, sticks can go in there. You fill it with water um, and hopefully some hoverflies will come along and use it for breeding. If you've got an allotment, um, there's plenty you can do there to help our pollinating insects. Um, so, for example, you can plant pollinator friendly crops and herbs. And these are plants that attract pollinators to the allotment. So uh, plants like raspberries, currants, sweet peas, courgettes, tomatoes, borage. Um, they're all really, really good for attracting um, pollinators in. And obviously those a lot of those pollinators will be carrying out some pest control services for you as well. So definitely good ones to plant. Um, you could also consider using a green manure. So these are, are plants which are grown to benefit the soil, um, but they can also attract uh, beneficial insects such as pollinators and predators of pest spe species while also improving soil fertility, soil structure uh, and drainage and, and can also help to suppress weeds. You can also keep some uh, wild areas on the allotment to attract those beneficial um, insects in. So things like ladybirds and, and ground beetles. Um, and as with all the other sort of habitats, we've looked up some additional suggestions. It include uh, not pulling up all of your weeds um, and creating additional habitats such as, you know, a pond or, or wet area will really help uh, to encourage a greater diversity of pollinators. Old churchyards often support species rich grassland as they haven't been improved over time. And a relaxation of mowing in some areas of formal lawns can also encourage the natural formation of good quality flower rich grassland. And any areas of species rich grassland could be managed as traditional hay meadows, so cutting as late as possible in the autumn to allow plants to flower and set seed. But it's always important to remember that some short crop lawns support nesting aggregations of our mining bees and therefore should be maintained. And also that churchyards often have wax cap fungi present, again, because the grassland hasn't been improved. So it's always important to know what is present before making any changes to management regimes. Um, and churchyards often have uh, good amounts of blossoming shrubs and valu valuable mature or, or veteran trees too. It's possible you might be involved with the management of um, some urban woodlands and these can vary in their quality quite a bit. Um, some are remnants of ancient woodland um, and some are areas with lots of pressures which con consequently have little or no ground flora. But some general rules that can help improve smaller or urban woodlands are that you could carry out some coppicing to create some open areas in the woodland or have rides or clearings. And this often helps the um, sort of flower rich ground flora. You could also promote native spring blossoming trees and shrubs at the edges of rides and clearings or along sunny woodland margins. And this could be done through um, planting or encouraging particular species to regenerate naturally by giving them a bit of space. Um, and finally, you can um, control invasive species such as rhododendron, Japanese what knotweed, Himalayan balsam, etc., as these all have the potential to take over an area of woodland. Hedgerows can be a vital resource for pollinating insects as they provide that early forage for emerging bumblebees and solitary bees in particular. So things like blackthorn are very important. And the hedges, their associated banks and tussocky grassland can also provide lots of nesting, sheltering and overwintering habitat. So 
Rotational management of hedgerows will provide habitat for a range of wildlife, not just pollinating insects. So cutting only a, pro a proportion of the total hedgerow in any one year, and not cutting annually, will allow production of flowers and, and berries. So that will be of the most benefit. Obviously, if you've got hedgerows along uh, roads or need um, access, then they might need to be trimmed more often than that. But the ideal is to uh, not cut annually. Um, and wherever possible, hedges should be cut after the berries have finished and uh, before any breeding birds start. So scrub is the final um, little bit of habitat we're going to look at. It's a major source of, of blossom, of shelter and, and shade. Um, but if unmanaged, it can uh, take over other valuable habitats such as grassland or bare ground which reduces those sort of habitats that are um, available for uh, our pollinating insects. So cutting uh, scrub on something like a, a 10 year rotation works really well. It ensures that the scrub has um, the chance to, to flower and blossom, but also prevents it taking over the habitat completely. So some bits of general advice to finish up. Um, first one is don't be too tidy. Those rough, untidy corners are really important for um, shelter and nesting areas for insects, um, and especially as overwintering sites. Uh, try not to pull up all of your weeds. Um, these are what we call our native wildflowers and often provide really important pollen and nectar resources. Don't use pesticides. These are really harmful to our pollinating insects and um, all wildlife too. So also think about the uh, flowering plants that are available for our pollinating insects. So the greater the diversity of, of, of flowers, the greater the diversity of pollinator species a, a habitat can support. Try and grow uh, native plants as they're most accessible to our pollinators and also adapted to um, our local areas. And also encourage uh, a diversity of habitats. So we've looked at how many of our pollinating insects um, require two or more habitats to complete their life cycle. So having that diversity will enable species to complete their, the whole of their life cycle. Um, and also avoid or minimise habitat management activities between April and September. And this will just ensure that pollinators are, can complete their life cycles. So a very final summary of what I've talked about today. Uh, pollinating insects have four basic needs that we need to take into account when we're managing land for them. They need um, food for both adults and the larvae. They need somewhere to nest. Um, they need habitats where they can shelter and overwinter. And they need uh, a mosaic of all of these habitats so that they can complete the whole of their life cycle. Um, if we're looking at how to manage land for um, pollinating insects, we need to understand the basic needs um, of those pollinators and take them into account. But there are lo lots of opportunities to improve um, habitats for pollinators. And as we've seen, even the smallest site can be improved. And really simple measures um, that we can all take on board will help um, benefit pollinating insects and uh, a huge uh, amount of other wildlife as well. So things such as not using uh, chemicals, retaining dead wood, not being too tidy and, gray and growing native plants will all really help. And it's also really important just to um, establish what you've got on site uh, before you improve it or undertake any works. And this just will ensure that any valuable features are conserved and really help to identify opportunities to improve the site for pollinators. So thank you for listening today to this webinar on an introduction to pollinating insects and how to manage land for them. If you are out and about and uh, see any pollinators, do please share your photos with us. Um, tag them Wild Pecked and our Twitter and Instagram tags are there. So please do share them. And thank you very much for listening.